Hello everyone, welcome on in. It is Betting Weekly Dojo. It is episode number six with myself, Nigel Seeley, and professional gambler and co-host of the show, it's uh, Neil Channing. Good afternoon, Neil. Co-host. I feel like I've been well, promoted. You are, you are the co-host. Um, it's bleak times here, I'm afraid, Nigel. It's been having a tough weekend. I uh, actually had my, I think yesterday might have been my worst ever evening of NFL. Uh, <sighs> I don't know. That's saying something. To... I can remember I a few of them back in the day. I've had some amazing times and some bad times. I've had a couple of Super Bowls that got a bit grim. But, uh, yeah. No, I had a lot of bets. And uh, I, I, can't, I can't say I cashed too many tickets. It's, uh, it's bad. And I, I've been having a bit of a bad run on the soccer as well. So, uh, you know, it's funny because I do a lot of things. So the horses have been okay recently. But... Uh, yeah, that stuff has not been good. How, what what were you betting on? Handicaps, uh, props, or, or uh, no? Lots of props, lots of props. I mean, last week uh, I made a small profit, uh, and I felt like I was a bit robbed. A couple of people were looking like they were going to beat their number. Uh, yeah, I was over there receiving yards and over there rushing yards, and uh, they got injured in the second half. That that was a bit annoying. Um, this week I haven't really gone through every single one, but like a couple of times, like maybe my guy got the most catches and the most receiving yards, but I'd backed him to score a touchdown any time and he didn't, uh, or I'd backed him to get the most yards and he'd scored a touchdown, but he hadn't got, he didn't go over his number. So, um, I always feel that's a bit annoying, you know, cause you mm. kind of sort of, if you fancy somebody to do well in a in a matchup, and you think, oh well, he's, you know, he's going to have a good game because the, you know, they're playing against a team with a weak running defense or something like that, and uh, you know, he's a running back, so you back him to score any time, and then he gets loads of yards, but he doesn't score. That's quite frustrating. Um, yeah, it was a bit like that yesterday. So yeah, gloomy, gloomy today. Sorry about that. I'm not my normal chipper self. Well, I, I, there's not much joyous of spring coming for me either, I'm afraid. Oh, it was no. an absolute awful day yesterday. Oh, this I mean, is good. People are just going pretty, to switch pretty, off in their drones. <laughs> it was pretty, well, I don't know. People might be encouraged by the fact that we do our bollocks. Uh, I mean, it's. Um, I, I actually had a, I had a disastrous day. But again, like you, I thought I read it right and just couldn't get them over the line. I had two, listen to this for a bad beat yesterday. So hmm. this is Saturday and Sunday. So I had four figure bets on, th- on uh, a few things. The hmm. first thing was I bet, uh, O'Connell to beat Massetti. O'Connell took the first set. Massetti took the second set. O'Connell was serving at 5 3 to win the match. Oh, uh, no. Got to 30 all. Couldn't hold his serve, was broken. Traded about minus 1,000. Oh, God. Lost his breath, and then he lost in a tie break. So I thought, okay, read that right. Got it wrong. But, you know, he was he was a plus money underdog. So I thought, okay. Following day, I saw Marion Chilich, who uh, is making a comeback after two years on the ATP Tour. I thought he's, a, he's playing against a Japanese guy in the, in the Far East. I thought this is going to be quite tough for him. He's been around uh, a long time. How old is very he? Very long time. Oh, I, I'm guessing 36. I'm guessing. Oh, I'll Google I it in a minute. Oh, when oh, when, you, when you're it. chatting, tell us some yeah. story. If you've got if you've got any story to tell us on this dull morning, <laughs> I will I will Google it. Uh, same thing happened. Uh, Chilich won the first set this time around. My man won the second set. Five three up, serving for the match. Broken. Then at four five, uh, Chilich serving two match points, fails to take him, loses in a tie break. So I've done. I've had match points. I, he must have traded fifty on. Like, no, probably tennis. Probably short, tennis probably. betting though. I don't even find tie breaks are so painful. Generally, I always feel like if I get to a tie break, I never feel optimistic. Yeah, especially if you're on the dog. If you're on the dog, then obviously that the, the favourite obviously has a has an opportunity to uh, to. Uh, to bright, to lift his game, but uh, that that was just a, just an awful thing. But the, over a period of time, you get to get two like that back to back. That was hard, you know. You're looking at two of those a month. You you sort of accept, or two a week, you might you know, sort of accept it. But two back to back. So then uh, we go on to the football, the soccer, and I'm heavy on under two and a half goals in the Arsenal Manchester City game. I think this is this mm. is going to be really tight. Two and a half goals, bet under two and a half goals. Realise my fate. So I thought, what do I do? Do I sit back? Do I do I think what I say? Just before the sending off, I thought what I'd do is I'll bet under three and a half goals to cover my stake and turn it into and a And red winning cards position. are so good for under, aren't they? It normally, it just kills well, the game. It was just before the under. Obviously, 97th minute, a goal for Manchester City, and uh, I lose my bet. And to, to actually, I, I, rang up, I rang up 
Simon Holden, friend of the show, friend of ours and friend of the show this morning, and he said, "Ah, oh, the great weekend. I bet the draw in the <laughs> Arsenal Manchester City match, and that really didn't help." Did me that cheer you up this morning? No, it didn't. No, it didn't cheer me up whatsoever. <laughs> but then one of the first subjects. I mean, I didn't know to the extent of how bad your weekend was because I was going to talk from my perspective how bad it was for me. But I, I, one of the points I wanted to make on the dojo here this week was how do you deal with these bad beats? I mean, obviously, if you bet a horse and you read it wrong. And it's last, uh, it doesn't go on the ground, or you you bet a football team and they get beat 3 0, or you, you, you get it completely wrong. I can sometimes accept that, but when I've read something like that and there's a match point and a last minute goal, it's very, very hard for betters to to get over that. I mean, you've, you've got you're, you're, you're not your chirpy self this morning, you're quite miserable, you know, you know, but you've done this a long time. There's a lot of people who come in and think, you know, I can't believe my luck here, my luck here, my luck. when's it going to turn? How I do you think- deal with those sort of runs? Well, I think, first of all, you know, that you're constantly questioning, how did I lose? Did I lose because, uh, you know, something fundamentally changed in the sport and I misunderstood it? Did I just make a bad bet? Uh, also, like, did I stake wrong? Um, I don't really think I did any of that uh, over the weekend. Hopefully not. Uh, so I can kind of shrug that off. The other thing is, it, I think it's like depends on prices as well. You know, I've spoke before about how I've played a lot of poker tournaments in my life. And, you know, sometimes you're in a poker tournament. You know, if you're in a small tournament, a local neighborhood kind of tournament, it might be 100 players, 200 players, something like that. So, you know, you're probably not going to win more than one of those in a year, uh, generally speaking. And it could take two years before you win your next one. Uh, if you go to the World Series and you play tournaments with, you know, thousands of players, uh, you could go your whole life without winning one quite easily and be a good player. So I guess having a background of doing that means that when I bet on a golf tournament, say, where I might back somebody at, I don't know, 20 to 1 or something like that, uh, and there's 150 players in the tournament, uh, if he gets beaten a playoff or, um, you know, he's just outside of the money, uh, if I've taken him win and place, uh, I might uh, I might not feel too bad about it because uh, you know I'm quite used to backing longer shots and and not not winning. Um, you know that seems fair enough. Same on the horses. Uh, it's a bit harder when you like NFL when I'm playing these props is kind of uh, you know dollar ten each of two, and uh, you know we're picking over under and uh, you pick one way and it goes the other way and you. Obviously, you're probably going to stake slightly more on those kind of things. Uh, and it's easier to get on as well. You can probably get a bit more on. Um, it is a bit harder to get over. I Actually, there's two NFL games tonight, and I had a couple of uh, bets that I was going to do. I think it's really important not to change. Like, I didn't... I, just because I done badly last night, I'm not going to think, oh, well, I'll just leave those games tonight. I won't play on them. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm having a bad run. Uh, and I'm not going to think, oh, well, I'll double down. I'll have twice as much on tonight because I'm due a winner and I want to get it back. You just you just have to kind of bat away, I think. Um, you know, I've just had the same, exactly the same bits tonight on, on, on the games tonight that I would have done uh, if, you know, if I'd have had a brilliant night last night. I yeah. think if I'd have had an absolutely brilliant night, I might have just played maybe 10% more on those bits tonight. But I think it's dangerous to have more if you if you're coming off a loser, I think you need to be careful about that. But uh, I, I just think you have to bat on, really. Yeah, the fo- I think the you're football's right, a bit different. On. I can definitely take a break from the football, the soccer, because there's so much of it and it goes on forever. Uh, I don't mind taking a break from that if I'm having week after week of losing. Um, it, that that has been a bit poor lately. I haven't had a great run on the on the soccer, and uh, no. I, I've slightly staked down on that. I think the thing is with the soccer as well, and I've said it to you before in the past, I've said it on, on this channel many times before, that a lot of experts say don't have a bet really till November, till you get the form. You know, the, the start of the season is very, very hard. You, you just keep your head above water really to start of the season. This weekend on the football, I bet about 10 different matches. I think I did nine. I should have followed the guys on Betting Weekly Extra Time, Steve and James. They absolutely smashed it out of the park five bets uh, six bets five winners on their official picks well done to the boys there um but what i did is i bet about nine teams but you said about staking it was the key point i for some reason i doubled 
my stake on one of the teams, Charlton, on the draw no bet market. I should have stuck them to the stake of the level all the others. I doubled them because they had such a good home record. I thought, you know, they're not going to lose it. Draw, get a push. I don't mind that. I mean, I no, but I shouldn't have stake. I shouldn't have stake. I got the stake. I don't do. I don't. I would not argue that you should level stake because I don't agree with that. I think that you no, but vary, I, I actually, vary your stakes according to how much you think each bet is is value against what you perceive to be the correct line. But what I would say is don't vary your stakes according to how you're doing. If, you, yeah, yeah. if you've been doing well, I mean, yeah, if you're doing really well, you know, you can look at, you know, the famous staking plan is Kelly criteria. So you can, you can look at your bankroll and assess the percentage edge that you've got and, and have, make your stake a proportion of that. Um, and and that w- Kelly would say that if you're winning now, all your stakes go up because your bankroll's gone up, and so the percentage that you bet of that bankroll on a certain edge should go up. But uh, I, I I don't I don't mind that, but I don't I don't think you should vary it too much just on how you've been going. I think you should just vary it on how strongly you fancy. If you fancy Charlton and they were to you the best bet of the day, you should definitely have more on them. Well, that was the problem. They weren't. They were all the, they're all good bets. And my, I lost uh-huh. marginal on the football at the weekend. I think I lost about hundred pound or something like that. Well, mm. accumulative on the on the matches. But if I kept the Charlton stake smaller and I put more on the Chesterfield one, which I should have done double though I did, mm. it would have been a winning weekend. And that was my point. I just went I'd... a little bit. I was, I was on the show on Friday and I, uh, I, I wasn't Chester, but it was Colchester. I put up Colchester. Sorry, Colchester the one. I sorry, uh, I have to think Colchester. Easy yeah. to get confused. Colchester and Chesterfield. Yeah, Colchester and uh, and Notts County were my two. Notts County mm. got got burned for me badly. Yeah, so I should have had more. Charlton was the reason I lost, but then it's, uh, then I the, the the bad beats were terrible. So that's all, pretty much how to do is keep soldiering on as the advice on your channel. This is someone who's this is this is two guys who've gone through. <laughs> Many, but many, I do, bad you know, I do, think, it, I do think it's important not to go on tilt. You know, you shouldn't no, be no. thinking, right, I need to win that money straight back. You know, I've had a terrible week three on the NFL. Uh, I'm sure I'll have just the same number of bets next week and I'll have the same kind of stakes on each one. Um, and yeah, I probably won't win all the money back next week. I, I, I probably need three good weeks to get that money back. And, you know, three consecutive winning weeks is hard to do. Um, but you know, we we just we chip away. I can I can, I can feel, see it in your body language. How you're not in a great mood today, Jack. No, I'm sorry about that. So, no, no bad problem. News. No problem. Uh, anyway, let's move on. Um, just we're going to talk about another couple of subjects. And this this is something that I've always liked to talk about, and it's something that I'm sort of fair, but you've referred to it so many times in this episode. You've come on this show and you said to me, oh, I bumped into an, oh, I've got a sumo guy. I've got a, <laughs> an American football guy. I've got a tennis guy. I've got a golf guy. I've got a, 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 a whatever, every sport. You've got somebody you know you can pick up the phone or send a text. I mean, in this world we live in with all these different sports, I think John said there was 256 different sports. I don't even have 256 friends on Facebook, let alone two <laughs> friends to bring up to about betting on the sports. But, um, how important is it to, to have a circle of experts around you that you know, I've got a quite opinion and, and get that second opinion from those. I, I think that's a very, very important if you're looking at becoming a yeah, professional I think gambler. Yeah, I think it's integral. Uh, I, I Actually, I, I, there is some good news. The the uh, the sumo went well this weekend. Oh, he, did he have the 9-1 to one shot? <laughs> when it was 10-0 last he week. He won, he won. Yeah, oh, my smallest brilliant. bet for months on anything. Uh, he won the whole, whatever they call it, the Grand Salami. Um. Yeah. Fabulous. Os- Osonato, <laughs> I think he's called. I think what a great. What's his name? I think he's called Osonato. I'd have to look it you, up. You had much better. Uh, you had much better results from Japanese sports stars <laughs> than I did uh, this weekend. So there you go. So you've done very, well with that. But I mean, it's important. Very good. But no, no. So I, I, I think what you're saying though. Um, I mean, it's funny, isn't it? Because we live in an internet world these days. Uh, it's very easy to become a better these days and just sit online and do all your bets online and never really interact with other betters but you can interact online there are forums and people discuss stuff and uh you know social media is a big place for people to hang out and talk about sports and stuff Betting Weekly Studios as well, Neil. Betting Weekly Studios. Yeah, that helps. (laughs) But, I mean, yeah, people do get involved. I mean, I notice in the comments to these videos, people quite often sort of say, I fancy this, I don't fancy that, oh, you should get on this and whatever. And I think people do have a desire to talk about what they're betting and to discuss it with other people. 
And if you, you know, if you do live in Pig's Knuckle, Arkansas, uh, and you're tens of thousands of miles from civilization, uh, you might, you might not know anyone else that you can talk to about this kind of stuff. And uh, I guess you can find those people online, but uh, I mean, you know, us two being old dinosaurs, we, we go back a long time and we, we, we also worked in the betting industry where we met a lot of people uh, who all had expertise in different sports. And, uh, you know, I think we've both kept in touch with quite a lot of those people. Um, and, uh, you know, friends of friends of friends. I used to go to the track a lot, get to meet a lot of gamblers there. I used to go to snooker tournaments and golf tournaments, darts tournaments. Uh, and you'd get to know people uh, and you keep in touch with them. I, I, social media is quite good for that. But I, I, I think, it, yeah, I mean, I... I, I I read sometimes people say, oh, you know, to be a successful gambler, you have to specialise. You've got to, uh, you know, in the soccer, you can't be an expert on every division. How can you be an expert on French and German and Italian and Spanish and, and UK all at the same time? Uh, if you just concentrate on, I don't know, the championship in the UK and nothing else, you'll get to know the teams much better and you'll have better bets. Well, that's definitely true. Uh, but you're not going to find many bets, are you? You're probably going to, you know, on a slate of games at the weekend, you might have three bets, uh, maybe five if you're really looking for something. And uh, the more bets you have, the lower your overall ROI will probably be. Uh, and if you could look at a few other divisions, you'd find some more bets. But but now to look properly at all of the divisions and to really have a, a keen eye on the team news and uh you know all that kind of stuff is it, it, very time consuming so you know if you if you've got a mate who does the french and you do the spanish and he does the italian and you do the german uh and you can exchange well this is so good you you can you can double your output without spending twice as long on it uh, i i just think that's essential really i think that's the one thing that i miss while working at home uh, for the last, I've, I've worked on my own now for literally 15 years, I suppose, 16 years. And the one thing I miss is working in a trading room. When we worked together, in front of me, I had the motor racing guy on the right. I had the golf guy to my left. I had the cricket guy one row in front of me. The football guy to the left of me, who's got on to bigger, better things. I've had the, uh, you had the horse racing guys in the middle row. And you could just ask them, what, what's the angle? What, what's the bet? And then we'd share information and you could just talk to them and say, what's the angle here? Or if you had an opinion and that you, I, I like this bet, what do you think? And they'd talk you in, they'll say, yeah, it's brilliant reasoning. That is the one thing I miss. Very lonely when you're at mm. home. Your day well, that was day. I mean, that was definitely a big edge. And we, we were lucky because we mm. worked in an office with some particularly hot cookies who have largely gone on to all make more money than we'll ever see. Mm. Um and um yeah they were expert in a lot of sports but I I also think you can get a little bit distracted by too much of that and and you need to pick and choose and be a bit careful about it and cute I I quite like um just sort of picking I, I I'm still in touch with a lot of those people and uh every now and then or quite often I'll I'll speak to some of them and you know WhatsApp's been really good for that you don't have to have millions of phone conversations every day people don't like me phoning them up i am go on too much uh but uh you know you can do a quick whatsapp what do you think about this have you looked at that have you got an opinion on this uh but yeah i mean you're right essentially we're sat at home on our own and it, it can be a bit um you know it's a solo a solo occupation really isn't it it's quite funny i i, I do think though you know the more sports you can bet on there's other advantages to it too because, you know, in this day and age, you're in a situation where if you're consistently winning off of bookmakers, they, they're not going to stand for it. Uh, your account might be restricted or you might not be able to bet at all. Um, if I open an account with a new bookmaker and I start betting just on Sumo uh, and nothing else and, you know, I just bet four or five winners, uh, they probably won't like the look of my action. If you know, the same if I do it on the snooker or on the darts or uh, ice hockey or whatever it is. If I go on and I appear to bet on twenty different sports over the weekend, and uh, you know I'm splashing away on things that you know from five continents, and you know there seems to be no rhyme or reason to it. 
I'm much more likely to get a spin. They're gonna they're gonna want to take me on. They see they think that I'm you know just a fairly recreational gambler. Uh, because how can I be betting on all these things and know what I'm doing? So, uh, you know, having having people to help you on all sports is great. I also find the abdication of responsibility quite good. I um, if, if I've got a guy who I think knows something and knows about a sport, I don't, I don't bother reading about it at all. I just, if they send me the bets, I just get on. I, I don't, I'm not interested in their reasoning they can start telling me oh it's because this guy does this and he matches up with him and this bloke's out injured i couldn't care less if he says it's a good bet and i know that over the years he's a winning guy i just want to follow him in Mm. i think that's i think i think it's so important to have good people around you when you're doing this because unlike a lot of people on social media and unlike a lot of people you watch on on these instagram accounts where these tipsters are coming out and they're giving you a pick on pick on every single sport, every single um, in, in COVID it was horrendous watching these people just coming up with it. But that's all people taking up bar, table tennis matches and all these kind of stuff, you know, trying to, to clickbait, trying to get you in. But I think it's so important to have really, 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 really good quality people around you who are experts because however much you think you are good at something, there is always someone better than you at your. If you've got an angle or something someone will know a little bit of information more than you and the idea of to reach out to just get a second opinion to, to just let you know all oh, that players out injured all that players out injured and i think I, I really lost that really a lot in covid and when covid was on i i was going to lots of the football but i didn't really go a lot and i i was speaking to people who would go and watch football matches week in and week out and they knew the players they knew the strength of the kids coming in they knew the strength of the loan sign who's gone out they knew that the manager's uh, wife hadn't been very well they knew everything and when I used to go to the football match, I used to speak to the old boys who used to who'd been there for twenty five years, and the information you got from them was priceless. Well, and I think that stuff snippets out. That stuff's amazing. I mean, uh, you know, there's stories from the old days of Billy Walters in America uh, having a contact at the airport. I'm sure I've said this one before, and, and he no, was getting like noticed. newspapers from around the country. Uh, you know, just he would get the guy who was cleaning up the the, the trash from the aeroplane as it came in. And he'd say, well, bring me all the newspapers. And uh, he'd get, you know, the kind of uh, whatever it was, the Seattle Times or the, um, you know, the uh, the Minnesota Bugle or whatever it's called. Um, and he'd be able to see the news on the college teams from, from those towns that wasn't necessarily making its way into the, the Las Vegas sun. Um and, you know, I think that kind of thing, uh, I think Tony Bloom used to do that when he first started. He had a whole network of people who he knew were football fans and were fans of a specific club. And he would get them to email him with details of like transferred players and loan players and stuff like that. Uh, and that would that would give him an edge like that. that. I mean, I don't know. I don't think he does that anymore necessarily. A lot of that stuff is available online now. But in the early days of the Internet, I, I think that was quite an important way to get information. I mean, these days you can get amazing information just following people on Twitter. Like if you're into darts and you follow all the darts players, it's quite easy to find out, you know, who doesn't really fancy it at the moment or who's got a slight injury or who's, uh, you know, having some personal problems or maybe if they have COVID or something like that. You know, stuff that can give you an edge in the tournament but, you know, if you start following 10 different sports, you're going to be following 300 sportsmen and it's going to mm. drive you mad. Um, so, yeah, if you, can, if you can find people who are expert in different sports and, and, and use their information, oh, so good. Yeah, I mean, the other thing is you find a lot on the Premier League and the big leagues around you, but when you go into the English lower leagues, it's very, very hard to find. They don't do the press conferences. You know, they'll say that someone's a so-and-so is injured, but you're the replacement. You wouldn't really know much about him. So I just like I, I still like this network of people. I think it's it's paramount if you want to be a successful gamer. I think to have it, you know, you can't do it all on your own. However much you think you can, you can't do it all on your own. To have good people around you, that you can to hang, ask questions and to ask advice for and people to mark your card on different sports I mean I, I'm i a good judge on tennis I'm a good judge on football I'm a decent judge on darts pretty much everything else I know nothing but I know 20 people 
who do know things about that sport. And that's why I had that on them for the exact same reason Neil said there, when they give me a bet, I trust them entirely. And that sort of goes on to my final topic here. It's, it's obviously tipsters and touts on, on social media have just got, it gone crazy over the last two years or so. Uh, the American market has gone mad with tipsters and touts. You've got walking bets. I don't know if you've seen that girl. She's walking around looking rather... Rather attractive, walking around giving her a bet. You've got people coming out now. The no, I haven't doing seen that. Stuff. I don't think I'm allowed to follow things like that. Well, you, you have to have a look at it. Have a look. There's, but there's all these tips coming. I, I don't want to get in trouble at home. Well, yeah, but the best thing not to do. But we, we, we both run tipping websites. Mm. Now, the first question that people says to me, we'll come on to the other tips in the world. First people come on to the question to me says, if you made so much money or you, you're a successful gamer, why are you giving your tips away for free? That's the first question that everyone, or why are you sending a subscription mm. for this? And that's the question I want to ask you, Chaz. Well, you know, if you're, if you're making so much money and you, you're doing this, why, why, are you, why are you giving your tips away? Well, I mean, actually, I started doing it because uh, a friend of mine thought it would be a good idea for a business and he asked me if I fancied getting involved and, uh, I, you know, he talked me into it, basically. But I, um, yeah, I mean, the, the, the simple answer is you can do both. You know, it doesn't stop me doing my gambling. Everything, so I have a tipping site called Betting Emporium, which I um, started up with another guy called Joe Beavers. And, um, yeah, pretty, we have, we have tipsters, for, you know, I do the horse racing stuff there uh, and some golf. And uh, we have a guy that does football, darts, tennis. Uh, we have a guy that does rugby, cricket, American football. Um, and from various time to time, we've covered other sports. Um, the, the, the main thing, the, the simple answer to your first question is, you know, I bet on everything that we tip on on the site, uh, it's been a long-term winning thing. You know, every year that you'd follow the site, you'd be winning. We're having a terrible run at the moment. Uh, but, you know, it's, it's still a winning proposition. And it doesn't stop me getting my bets on to have subscribers to the site. Now, maybe if we had tens of thousands of subscribers, it might be difficult. It might mean that the prices go really quickly and I can't get my bets on to the size I want to. Uh, but actually, we've never really, we've kept it as a sort of fairly kind of niche thing uh, and a bit of a sort of a, a boutique service. Uh, and we have, we have quite a relatively small number of customers who are very loyal. Uh, and basically, we've got. We, I think we've been doing it eleven years now. We've basically got the same customers we had in year one. I mean, every now and then we're having an absolutely brilliant run, and we get a whole load of new customers. And then, of course, if we have like one bad week, uh, we lose a lot of them. Um, and you know, that's kind of inevitable thing, I guess, with tipping sites. Uh, we we tried to make it very ethical when we started. I, I think there's a whole load of things I don't like about tipping sites. First of all, I think it's very important to be transparent with the results. So we always update the results. It's very clear on the site. It's broken down between sports and events and whatever, and you can easily see what we've won on and what we've lost on. There's plenty of things that we've lost on over the years. Uh, luckily, we've won more on the things that we've won on. Uh, so that's good. Um, <clears throat> I think it's really important that people know when the tips are coming out. I see that a lot with tipsters, uh, subscription tipsters. They'll say things like, uh, oh, we had a great week because we had this bet. And, and basically they had a bet at sort of three in the morning in UK time because something came out in America about an injury. Uh, and they just played on the prices before they got updated. And, you know, the, the, book, the bookmakers were slow to react to somebody getting injured. You know, we talked about that situation last week with, uh, Christian McCaffrey, um, uh, you know, if if I've got to sit there twenty four seven glued to my screen in case a tip's going to come through from the site I subscribe to, and if I miss that one tip, that's going to mean that I don't make a profit on the week. Well, uh, you know, now I'm doing a job, aren't I? The reason that people subscribe to tipping sites is because generally they they don't have time to do the work themselves, and they don't want to have to. So if I can say to them, well. You know, the soccer will be coming out on Friday and the NFL will be out on Saturday morning. They they know when to tune in and look for the tips. Uh, they they don't look and say, oh, I missed the prices because, you know, the other subscribers all smashed it up yesterday and I wasn't looking. Um, so I think that's quite important. I like I like that. Um, well, the other things we do, we don't really, we, we, we go for kind of low ROI, but things that are quite easy to get on. Mm -hmm. So we don't pick 
sort of obscure bets and you know funny props that are only available with one sports book in uh nicaragua or somewhere um you know we try and think of things that pretty much everyone should be able to get on widely available stuff but of course the more widely available it is the, the you know the less chance that you're going to find a huge edge on it so we're working off quite small edges uh and and so people you know generally we have kind of higher staking customers that are having high volume uh and uh and and making a little you know chipping away a little bit of profit each time i don't i don't you know, there's different ways to play it i see tipsters boasting that they you know we win 15 percent year on year well i mean that's fabulous if you can do that and i can get the bets on and consistently you're winning 15 percent well i'll be a multi-millionaire very quickly but I think when you start looking into those things, uh, the 15% is often based on prices that are not widely available, prices that disappear within seconds, uh, thing, things that maybe they had a one-off big winner, something like that. Maybe they had a 100 to 1 winner and, and didn't really have any other winners for the rest of the year. Obviously, the 100 to 1 still counts if they tipped it. But you know, if you just miss that one winner because you happen to be away that week or something, uh, that's a bit painful. So I, those things are kind of annoy me about tipsters. If they're not transparent, and they don't tell you what time they're putting their bets up, and they tip on sort of mythical prices, I, and that's what I hate. Well, I I actually worked with you, Channis, didn't I? I started writing. I was doing your tennis stuff mm, back six or seven years ago, and and probably longer than that, probably about ten years ago now. And the one thing that you and Joe said to me was that we could only bet with three major bookmakers at the time. So that mm. the, the client base could get on. Obviously, at the time, I was betting things at plus one fifty, which were available at plus one seventy five with with books that we knew that our market wouldn't be able to get the price on. And all you do is opening up yourself to more complaints that the price wasn't available. And I took the model that you had, or sort of a similar kind of model, when I sort of got bigger in America and bought it. I, I set up Premier Sports Plays in America, and that was six years ago. And at the time, nobody was really betting on Eng giving tips on English soccer. No one was mm. the Premier League. No one was doing the tennis. No one was doing stuff like that. And I realized that the American market would, had been completely and utterly had their the the warp all over their eyes in terms of tipping markets. You know, they used to pay, ring up a telephone number, give you a bet, it would be someone on the money line to win at minus 1,000 and you were paying 9.99 for that tip. And then they would boast it. The one thing that still grates with me in the American market is that they, they if they give 10 tips, they say we went seven and three this week. Mm. So everyone works that out as their average. Oh, they're 60% profit, 60% mm. winning tips. Well, the seven tips are at minus $4. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you're losing funny. money. It's yeah, the most yeah. ludicrous thing. And there's people who do this online. There's people mm. who do this on similar kind of channels to what we do, who say our tips have got sixty percent strike rate, we're fifty four and f forty, mm. but thirty of the fifty four shot are minus two dollars. Yeah. So th there's no ROI, no calculation. Well, also, people that, people that say, "Oh, yeah, we went at under eighty three in the first half points in this NBA game," and you're like, "Well, yeah, the line everywhere was eighty one and a half. There's just like one guy had eighty three, you know, and." Okay, fair enough. Maybe the game ended up seventy-seven or something. But uh, you know, over the long run, if you if you're just going to pick off standout prices and then boast about it afterwards, it's just not it's, really it's, sustainable. It's it's, it's, it's I mean, there's you know there's people here who have built up big numbers and big stuff like that, mm. and they are when we do the props on the Bet River show for the Premier League, we record on a Thursday. You know, there will be a shot on target. And it's a very popular bet with some of the lads. And I said, listen, I don't want anybody to put on shots on target anymore because the line, by the time we're live on Saturday, the line's moved mm. too much. So they might see a price at plus 130. Mm. By Saturday, it's minus $2. It could move that much. Yeah. And there's people who are putting it up in their group. Mm. A, a guy to have more than half a tackle, more than six tackles, whatever. I don't even look at that market. More than one shot on target at even money. Out of 400 people, 300 people, how many are going to get on? Two, ten? Ten of them are going to get on? Like, even something it's like crazy. a big market, like, like you know, a side in the NFL, you know, we're, we're, we're recording this on Monday. Obviously, there are, there are prices available for next Sunday's games already. There were prices available last week for next Sunday's games. But, you know, if somebody wants to go and have 3,300 on, 
they're going to struggle to get on. You know, you can, you can, yeah, if you want to bet a 110 to win a 100, you'll probably be all right now. But um, it, it's, you know, the NFL market is ridiculously strong on Sunday afternoons. Like, uh, you know, you can bet half a million on a game on a Sunday afternoon. Uh, but on a Monday afternoon, you really can't. Uh, and if you can only beat the market on a Monday afternoon, but you can't beat it on a Sunday, well, you're not, you know, I mean, of course you do whatever you do. If you're a pro punter, I think it's absolutely fine to go and crack away on a Monday afternoon. That's that's where your edge is. But if you're trying to sell it to 10,000 customers and tell them they should all do that, I don't think I don't think that's right because they're just not it's, it's not possible for all of those people to get on. I think I think transparency is absolutely key. Make sure if you're ever going to follow any tips to make sure they give you a full record, have at least two to three years record, total transparency. And you got to remember some of these people coming out of the I mean they've only been betting for a year and and talk they're tipping up in Georgian football and Latvian second divisions. I mean they've never and seen anything about it looking at a table unless you've got a young kid who's got a, a program that's a, a model that is absolutely smashing out results i think you're very very anyone who's sitting there trying to bet on that and just putting prices up on on social media i'll get on this now at plus 110 in play i mean mm. by the time you've read it by the time you've you've you've, you've got in it's, it's minus 130 you're losing money so i get very frustrated with it because i think the people who we get I I get a bad rep for being a tout in America. People say you're a tout or you're a tipster, uh, and I've had a lot of criticism about it. But I don't think from the model that you and Joe built on betting and pouring, I've sort of used that total transparency. When we, have, when we have a bad run, we have a bad run. We're not hiding away from the fact. When we have a good run, we have a good run. But we spread it work on small margin at prices that are available for everyone to get. There's full reasoning for why we bet it. And you know, at the time, I did it because I didn't really have much work, and and I was I was I was trying to build a. a, a, a it's a, funny though because I, I I sort of wonder. I think I, I think in America it is you know it's kind of a bad scene, isn't it? It's got a bad reputation, but the tout business. Whereas in the UK, I think people people don't really mind tips as that much, but what they object to is paying. Like yeah. there's quite a lot of free content that you can get in the UK that's of a high quality, you know, really high quality. I can look in horse racing, I can read a load of really good stuff before, you know, on a Friday afternoon for the big races on Saturday from 10 sites I could name off the top of my head where they're doing really good work um, and people are making that available for free. And then obviously that uh, people sort of say, well, why should I pay? Because I can get this stuff for free. Of course, the thing is with the free stuff, if it's good, people are following it and the prices are just getting smashed to pieces really quickly. You know, there's one particular tipster in the UK. He he puts up a horse bet or two every morning at nine o'clock. By three minutes past, the horse is halved in price. I, I'm not, you know, I would never, I think he's an absolute genius who knows more about horse racing than 99.9% .9 of people in the world. Uh, but effectively, I, w I wish he, he would charge, really, so that less people could look at it, and, and I, would, I would have a chance of getting on and getting the prices. Mm. Mm. Yeah, very interesting. I mean, let us know your thoughts about uh, tips as touts, anything you've had a bad experience or anything like that. I mean, like, like I said at the top, when I mentioned there, I mean, the reason I did it was because at the time I didn't really have much work. I started building a big profile on social media it was a very very american based profile and at the time there was no one doing it in america especially on english premier league and, and that's what i've done but now you don't need all that because you've got all your tips here on the show for free well, you weekly studios. you've got your football you've got your tennis you're gonna you get your betting daily every every day at 11 o'clock eastern you're at four o'clock you've got the dojo giving you a valuable dice all you got to do is click that subscribe button channel them you know what they got to do well, I, I, I'm relieved now because for a second there, I was thinking you were going to let the whole show go without saying to me. I think last week, I mean, even though we banged on about it, only one in 10 people that watch this on YouTube press the like button. I mean, oh, that we is could do better than that this week, surely. One surely. in 10. I mean, surely this week we can beat that. Come on, guys. Press that like button. You've got Hit to press that like button. It's going to cheer Chandler's up. He's not. He hasn't been happy today. I've He's had been a, a bad week. weekend. He's had apart a tough from, week. Apart from this. the, uh, you know, the action in the in the uh, Japanese sports, um, it's all been bleak. Yeah. 
I've, I've had a bad Japanese weekend as well, so it's no good for me, the Japanese sports. But we haven't had any stories, and it's not because Chan is in a bad mood. I'm in a bad mood. We're talking about this. We need to have a funny story. I'm going to tell a story here, Chan. Oh, I'm, te- I'm going to tell the story, and it's the story I told you off air the other day. I thought I'm going to let it out, but I thought we haven't had a funny story yet on the show, so I thought this would be a good opportunity to tell the story. I, I told you and John uh, when we were off air in, uh, in New York, so we'll end on a funny story. So we were talking about you know, tipping. And at the time I wasn't really doing much work. So I've pretty much done everything. I had a, I had a burger van. I was driving up London selling burgers. I was uh, doing everything I can. I was going on television channels in America, trying to build my my profile until these, these kind of opportunities come my way. And at the time I was, I, I could get my hands on lots of tickets. So I always get tickets for tennis. I used to get tickets for football. And people used to say, oh, can you get me a ticket? Now I never really charged anything on it. I just put like a, a tenner or something, you know, just give me a drink so I could just eat. Or, and, but I had opportunities to buy t- tickets. By, by the way, you know, presumably you had good connections with the Labour Party. Is that, is that where the <laughs> free tickets were coming from? Anyway, no, sorry, no, carry on. No, no. <laughs> I wish I could see someone to pay for my box at, uh, at the football. But anyway, I, I got these tickets. So, so this one particular guy, he rang me up and he said, um, I, I'm not, you, Nigel, I've got, your friend has given me my, your number and he said, uh, I'm looking for a couple of tickets. And I said, you might be able to help me. I said, yeah, sure, of course I can. What are you after? He said, I'm after a couple of tickets for Hamilton. So I went, sure, no problem. Leave it with me, leave it with me. So I said, okay, I'll call you back. So he said, when do you want to go? He said, any time in September or whatever the month, or was it August or something. I went, okay, leave, I'll get you, no problem. So that's easy. It's an easy 20 quid. So I went online, bought two tickets for Hamilton, rang him up. I said, I got you two tickets, mate. I said, no problem. You're on the, on the Tuesday. Oh, I can't believe it. I said, what day are you going? Tuesday, the sons of so-and-so. And so so I, I sent them across to him. So I sent you an email. I said, how much do I owe you? I said, oh, they're only going to be like 30 quid each. And just give me a tenner. So I give for 80 pound, that'd be done. He said, really? No more than that. We said, no, no, no problem. Sent him the tickets, come back. He said, there's a misunderstanding. He said, I wanted to go and see Hamilton the play. I bought him the tickets musical. to see Hamilton the race course to go and see the horse races. <laughs> I bought him two tickets to Hamilton the Hamilton races. Hamilton Park. Hamilton Park. Which is in Scotland. In Scotland. I got him two tickets to go and see <laughs> Hamilton Park. I couldn't get the tickets to go to, to Hamilton uh, and I lost 100 quid. on. I lost 80 quid on the deal. 60 quid on the deal. But that's, that's, a, that's a funny. I told you that off air the other day, but that was a, a You could have story, gone so. to see Hamilton Academicals, the football club. Yeah. Well, it's like when anyone asked me for Wimbledon tickets. I said, "Well, sure, no problem. They're at home to Bradford on the on the twenty fifth or the. I'm getting my way at Tranmere. <laughs> That's the Who was the team? Tickets. There was a team in Scotland, wasn't there? That used to play in Ibrox. Uh, not obviously not Rangers. There was another lower division team that used to play there. I can't remember who they were. Do you remember? I know the one that used to play at Hampden Park. Oh, oh, Hampden right. Park. It was there. not Ibrox. Sorry. I oh, was it Queen of the South played there. I think it might have been Queen of the South. Yes. So they used to. So Hamden Park is the national stadium in Scotland. It's it's a huge stadium. And this team, you know, on a good day, they'd have about 300 people would turn up to watch their games. They were barely professional, semi-professional, I think they were. Some of the players got paid. And um, a couple of friends of mine uh, bought season tickets to watch Queen of the South. Uh, I think it cost £300 for the whole season. Go to as many games as you want. I said, well, what have you done that for? Like, it's absolutely miles away. It's like you from London. It's like five hours to get there or something like that. You know, it's going to be, you, surely you're not going to go and watch them. And, of course, it was because they played at Hamden Park. Uh, there was going to be um, uh, the Champions League final was coming yeah, there that yeah, year. Yeah, very good. Uh, and because they were season ticket holders to Queen of the South, they got uh, they got the top tickets for the Champions League final. And uh, they were able to go to the Champions League final that year for about 300 quid. Well, that is a brilliant story. And we got a funny story out of Chalice at the end. It took, <laughs> us, it took us almost, what, 45 minutes, but we got a funny story out of him at the end of it. Uh, that reminds me of a story, Chalice, about Champions League. But I'm going to save it for another day. It's a very, very funny one. And uh, we'll talk about that on the next episode of The Dojo. Uh, Neil, where, where, where are they going to like us and subscribe? What, what are you asking these these viewers so to all do. they've got to do is just click the button click yeah. like and do. click subscribe um yeah that's it basically that is it and as neil says all the time this, this is not subscribing we're not, this is not a tipping line this is we're not advertising for our <laughs> tipping services this is just a free little button to click on subscribe it rings the bell and notifies you every time anything drops on the betting weekly studios youtube channel uh, loads of views over the weekend loads of winners from the european guys jack wright smashed it as well on the premier league the only person who let the site down was Yours truly. 
let him down on the oh, two and a half on the Manchester City game. Sorry about that, guys. Uh, that's been a wrap uh, for the week here, Benny Weekly Dojo. We are back next Monday for episode seven. If you want us to talk about any subject, if there are any questions you want to ask myself and Neil, put it in the comments bottom below, bar below. Lots of great comments in there, lots of positivity around this show. So thank you very much for all that. Uh, keep watching, keep subscribing, and uh, hopefully next week we can get Neil in a much better mood. He can have a nice, better NFL day and hopefully keep smashing it on the sumo wrestling. Thanks for your time, Neil. Good back, mate, for the week. Uh, take care, everyone, and goodbye.